Chapter 34 Trinity It came back to her now. A child, new to the ministry halls, new to the bed that her benevolent savior had provided, and to her new identity. She had been unable to sleep. She had wandered the corridors, searching for the stabilizing force just introduced into her life, her uncle. Around him she could be Sabrina Sabria, and the memories of that other girl, Annalise Cole, exiled to the boat on a painted sea, seemed farther away. Sabrina found her uncle's office empty and wandered into the council room, a small child lost among the oversized chairs. A candle burned in the alcove with pictures, but not nearly as many as she would see years later. She had discovered this same tunnel many years ago, where grown-up Sabrina now searched, and at its end, her uncle, working away beneath a silver globe perched on a column with four silver arms. His brow was furrowed at the connected wires and cables, referencing a palm screen resting on his thigh. He was startled but not angry when he saw her standing there in her pajamas, and he took her up quickly in his arms. A failsafe, Dag had called it. Now, many years later, she felt as if she were looking upon the same scene, her uncle beneath the silver globe, but this time trying to lower a glass case suspended from a column in the ceiling. A steel tube that telescoped down over the glass cylinder was attached to the case. Somehow she knew this sphere was the trigger of the weapon Theopin wanted. And I have seen it in my dreams, so many times. Dag was dressed in white trousers and a white shirt open at the chest. A blue jacket hung over shoulders which were more stooped and sunken than she remembered. His circle of silver hair was whiter, and his skin had become paler. It was as if he had aged years in the few weeks she had been gone. He leaned on a staff for support, its tip clicking on the floor with every step. He noticed neither the Elved nor Sabrina. His attention was riveted on the glass case, a barrier to seal off the trigger a barrier that jammed as it had descended. The room was spacious, the emptiness echoing with the sound of the storm, the rain rattling the windows high up near the ceiling, the dark glass a stark contrast to the white interior. Dag worked on the weapon, oblivious to Sabrina, turning his head every so often to look at something behind him. She maneuvered around the Elved's bulk to see more clearly, and gasped. The pounding she heard was not the sound of rain and thunder alone, but the hammering of rebels locked out by a glass barrier, reinforced with an embedded metal fencing. Sabrina immediately recognized Rickard, Vards, and Naelis, wearing their stolen helmets. The three rebels swung at the door with sledges and axes, the glass splintering in clouds of white. Their comrades applied laser torches and pneumatic drills to the edges and Sabrina could see other rebels bent over paneling and closing the biochemical snifters, trying to short them out. A second door opened with a gust of air, and a single figure stood there, looking up and down at the frame of the door as if pleased and surprised that it opened. Theopin. Sabrina knew him by his dun-colored robe, which he had donned as if he was not a part of a raid, but a ceremony. His face was the same, but his head was radically altered, no longer human. His boyish hair was gone, his skull bulged upwards like a giant egg, elongated and swollen. Tracks of stitches knitted together the mismatched patches of skin covering his elongated scalp. Sabrina recalled the operating theater deep within the caves, in the desert, and Theopin's mysterious disappearance. The red inflamed incisions had not had time to heal properly before the invasion was launched. His face glowed with a sheen of sweat. His eyes, despite the bright glare of the room, were dilated. Theopin raised his arms in a sudden swoop, his face turned upwards as if in thanks to his master. His men on the far side of the gate grew still for a moment, unsure whether to pray or to cheer. His arms aloft, he gazed triumphantly about the room. Dagosta laboring to draw down the glass case, the Elved listing to the side, and Sabrina hunched over her own mortal wound. Mild surprise registered on his face at the sight of her, one eyebrow arching for just a moment before the shock melted into a smile, as if to say, It's all meant to be.
and that he would accept the players present on the stage his master had set. More rebels stampeded down the corridor behind Theopin, but as soon as they neared the entrance to the room, an alarm sounded. The security gate slammed shut, blocking their way, their panting breath clouding on the glass as their palms were pressed white against it. Dagosta spun around at the noise and was astounded to see Theopin. Who are you? What? How did you enter here? Is that any way to greet your son, father? Dag seemed in shock, his head shaking and his lips moving soundlessly in disbelief, his eyes darting from the rebels held behind the door and the man standing before him. Even I stand surprised, for it seems I have a sister whom I never knew. Theopin nodded to Sabrina, and her uncle noticed her for the first time. Sabrina! Whether it was her presence or the Elved or both, Dag seemed to lose his composure again as he saw the injuries suffered by Sabrina and the Elved. He turned to Theopin. I don't know who you are, but I am not your father, and she is not your sister. He's Theopin, Sabrina said. He's their leader. But I am your son. The proof is in your own security system, father, said Theopin. Only those with biochemical signatures close to your own can enter the most sacred of your sanctums. Is it not true? Theopin raised his chin and breathed deeply, his smile inextinguishable. I understand some explanation is needed. A single name might suffice. Rashud, Akifa, Jadana. But I believe you simply called her Jade. Dag's face went white. He swayed as if he was going to collapse. He leaned heavily on his staff, his fingers clutching it so tightly that Sabrina thought it would break. The Elved turned his head in Theopin's direction. Theopin's face was unrestrained joy. Yes. She meant something to you, didn't she? He said. She studied under you, helped you develop your technology. Despite your affair and the love you professed for her, you still ordered her to undergo the treatment, like all of your students, their identities secondary in importance to your secrecy, to your control of your own technology, your own world. It was the only way, Dag whispered, bent double as if in pain. It was your way, Theopin spat, his face twisted in a sudden naked rage. But she did not follow your instructions he said, stalking closer. She faked the treatment out of some attachment to you. She wanted to remember you, even if it meant pain. She wanted to remember the man she loved. Theopin shook his head as if there was nothing in this world more repulsive than what he had described. His lips curled and his nose wrinkled. He spat on the floor near Dag's feet. Dag's hands began to lose their grip on the staff sliding down its length, his body weakening as if Theopin was raining physical blows upon him. The picture of the olive-skinned woman on Dag's desk flashed in Sabrina's mind. That sorrowful face. Those eyes full of empty longing. Now that she knew, she could see the same feature in Theopin's face. Right alongside Dag's. Why didn't I see it? To her surprise, there was something more for her to remember you by. Theopin said. Shortly after she moved to Lysander to assume the life you had planned for her, she discovered she was pregnant. She never told me. Dag's voice was barely audible. No, she did not. Out of some misplaced sense of loyalty to you, and perhaps afraid of what you might do to the child. I never... I thought it best to leave her alone. The burden of longing only mine. But it was not. She loved you. And the burden grew on her. You can imagine the loneliness of living in a place where everyone around you lives a lie, planted deep within them, and only you know the truth. Then, of course, there was the shame of betraying you, our dear leader, our great savior, her great love. It killed her. I watched her withdraw from the world, wither and die, but on her deathbed she confessed what she could to me. 
That was when I knew you were the evil one. And that your slaves must rise up against the demon in their midst and smite you. Dag had taken three steps forward, then collapsed to his knees, weeping into his hands. Can you ever forgive me, son? Forgiveness? I would sooner offer a snake a place in my home. All I want, all we want, is your annihilation. Because that is what the Master wants. You are an instrument of the enemy. It has been a long road to this point. He has tested us, but our faith sustained us. And that is my proof that we are righteous in our mission to save this world from your folly, your lies. It is only proof that you are mad, Sabrina said, reaching for her blaster, only to find she had lost it in the chaos fleeing the laboratory. Theopin smiled at her empty holsters, as if her helplessness was further proof of his cause, a small miracle from his master. You should know, Dagosta, that it was Sabrina who helped me, and more importantly, my men, to see the light. I could never have led them this far without her. The pain increased across Sabrina's abdomen. She was left with only words to hurl. Don't believe him, Dag. He twists things. Your own technology will aid us, Theopin announced, his preacher's voice rising to fill the great hall. We will bend the world to his will, or destroy it in holy fire. And I am protected from your control completely. He gestured to his deformed head. Sabrina finally understood what he had done. You've implanted a helmet into your own skull. So it can never be removed. This way, the only voice I will ever hear is the voice of God. Not Dagosta. You don't understand, Dag said. You've only ruined yourself. I have saved myself and the thousands who follow me. Dag ran his hands across his balding head, so small in comparison to the grotesque deformity that was Theopin's. Dag spoke again, addressing no one in particular. I prayed for you. Prayed for all of you. All of the people who had to be treated. Dag's confession stopped Theopin, and for the first time, the smile left his face. Sabrina was not sure what her uncle meant, but she dug the necklace she had taken from the alcove out of her pocket and flung it at Theopin's feet. It's true. I found his... sanctuary. He has pictures of all the scripts ever processed, he has a picture of your mother. The necklace was hers. Dag spread his hands wide, staring at the necklace on the floor, curled like a lock of fallen, glistening hair. It was a simple, sentimental habit. Praying. A comfort to an old man that I had hoped would die with me, allowing the world to continue without such practices. Die with you? Theopin said. Sabrina could not contain her own impulse. Why, Dag? Why all this? She asked, waving her hand at the room around them and the world outside of it he had created. Why the lies? The muscles in Dag's jaw flexed, the skin around his eyes crinkled, and the ends of his mouth tipped downward. Some might mistake his expression for sorrow, but Sabrina knew him well, and she sensed the anger coming building within him. Because I grew up watching each side murder one another, he said, seething, his eyes locked ahead but unfocused, as if he were again witnessing countless atrocities in his mind. Each of them so convinced of their righteousness, so contemptible of the other side, this side, that side, the good side, the bad side, when really it was simple. There was a side that wanted peace and a side that wanted war. Those at war did not realize they were on the same side. The side that wanted death. To perpetuate hate, violence, righteousness. Religion had poisoned their minds so they could not see the humanity in one another. What if... What if I could remove the offending agent? 
What if I could remove the memories of the hurt and pain? The revenge. The recrimination. The ignorance. And then maybe the suffering would end. He dropped his face into his hands. I have made so many mistakes. Can you forgive me, my son? You will not receive absolution from me, Theopin said, sneering in disgust. He marched towards his father, the hem of his robes flaring as he stepped close to Dag. But his hand closed around the end of Dag's staff to disarm him. Dag's expression changed from supplication to resistance. Dag's thumb moved over a switch on the staff, and blades flared out of the sides, one punching through the flesh of his son's hand. Theopin cried out while Dag rose to his feet, the strength and nimbleness Sabrina knew returned. His pleading had been a feint. He swung the shaft over his head, and the room echoed with a crack as he struck Theopin's head. The glass on both doors fogged again with the cries of the rebels as their pounding resumed. The doorways flashed with the reckless discharge of plasma rifles and sparks as bullet caromed from door to wall. Dag continued battering his son, pausing only to depress a switch on the staff again. The blades on top retracted, and a single long knife shot out from the foot of the cane. Dag raised it over Theopin's side as the pounding protest on the doors rose like the clamor of wild drums. Stop, Dag! Sabrina yelled. He's your son. There is a larger world at stake here. He must die to save many. Her uncle shouted, his face flushed and red, his chest heaving from exertion. But Theopin was not ready to die. He snatched the end of the staff in his hand and flung it away from his father's grip. It clattered to a stop far across the room. Theopin stumbled as he stood but he steadied himself right before throwing himself at Dag. He used his uninjured hand to punch his father, striking his face, his other arm swinging uselessly, leaving a trail of blood. Theopin kneed his father in the stomach and groin. As Dag grabbed at Theopin's head, all stitches and tender red flesh, clawing at the incisions. Theopin howled, and Dag reached to choke him, striking at his head whenever his son tried to escape his grasp. But youth aided Theopin, and with a twist he tumbled his father off him. They struggled hand to hand again, with neither one holding the advantage. As the father and son grappled, the emergency gates bowed inward, the glass splintering and tinkling onto the floor. The voices of the rebel soldiers came through gaps they had smashed in the doors. Their numbers had grown as they converged on Dag's sanctum. They filled both corridors now, down the halls as far as Sabrina could see. Before long, they would be able to slip their weapons into the openings and fire. The contest between Theopin and Diagosta shifted again. Sabrina's head felt light, her stomach woozy, her heart beating out of rhythm. A wide puddle of blood had gathered on the floor beneath her, staining her boots and pants. Above it all, the silver globe lurked, its danger cloaked in sleek beauty. Four levers branching from the central support pillar surrounded the orb. A small gap circled its center like a planet's equator, indicating where the upper hemisphere clicked downward to meet the lower. A blast shattered a portion of one of the doors. A bolt of plasma followed, passing above Dag's head as he struggled with Theopin. He caught sight of Sabrina as she yanked down the first lever, her arms burning from the effort. Sabrina, wait! Dag was cut short as Theopin, blood seeping from his stitches, leapt on him and tried to take him to the floor, her uncle's shirt ripping with the force and bearing his naked chest. Sabrina pulled the second lever. It clicked loudly into place. She moved to the third, but the Elved had shifted its bulk down low next to her, his ruined, shattered face reflecting her own distraught expression a dozen times over the fragmented pieces. Merciless mother origin and devourest of all things, its screen said. She saw incomprehension in her own reflection, just as she had with number nine out in the desert with Sprocket. But the Elved was undeterred. He reached into its own torso where a number of cables had been frayed and severed. He ripped the remaining ones from their sockets. A chorus of alarms blared, 
He moved again, his arm brushing so close to Sabrina that she flinched, but his motions towards her were deliberate and gentle. His fingers probing another compartment on his left hip, he drew open the hatch and removed a power cell, severing the wires that trailed from it like entrails. Green lettering flashed on his screen, flickering. There must be less than ten. Can a machine go mad? The compartment on his right hip was damaged, and he had to wrestle with it in pathetic motions as his lamed arm began to malfunction. He finally tore open the hatch and removed the last cell. Ten what? But the screen went blank with the removal of the final power cell. The frame of the Elved shuddered, turbines and servos overheating as cooling fans shut down. The legs locked and the entire body crumpled unceremoniously, fluid draining, hydraulics collapsing with long, drawn-out hisses, like breath leaving a body. Until the machine was still and inert, the life in it gone. The human tissue behind that facade of steel and glass dying. Can a machine have faith? Dag was crying out, but his voice was distant as Sabrina placed a hand on the curved face of the Elved. Her uncle had forgotten that lesson he had taught her so long ago. The human mind, even his, was wired for belief, for the supernatural. A spirit in the sprockets. Left in their own space, even the Elveds had pulled what they could from the ether, from the incomprehensible signals of a world they were forbidden to enter. Somehow from it all, they had formed their own faith. With me at the center. The origin and devourest of all things. This is what madness looks like. This is faith. Her uncle surrendered after that, not even resisting as his son wrapped the sleeve he had torn from his own robe around Dag's neck. He choked his father until his breath was but a whisper, and then stopped, hearing the fourth lever click down into place. Sister Sabrina, Theopin said. A horde of murderous faces pressed against the glass. The second door began to shake and bow inward as the metal fencing within started to give way. Cries of victory rang out. Theopin called her name as she stretched her hand over the sphere. Sabrina, wait! She regarded him over her extended arm. Blood trickled down his face from his gaping sutures, while his eyes burned with a fervor she had not seen before. The pain in her abdomen was becoming unbearable. She fought to keep her hand from shaking while her legs felt sticky and hot with her own blood. She looked steadily at him. My name is Annalise. Theopin slowly stood, his hands together, his lips moving without sound as if he could not decide upon what name to use. He took a step forward. More glass rained down from one of the doors, broken shards scattering across the floor. Please pause and think, sister. This weapon has been given to us to convert the unbelieving. It is a gift of the Master. Do you not believe in his will, even now as we stand together at the brink of his holy kingdom? She made a fist as a new thread of pain wound through her torso and pulled with unrelenting force. It took all her concentration, all her will to remain standing. I believe now, Theopin. I believe in a new beginning. She looked at him as she opened her fist, casting a shadow, darkness over a silver planet, her blood leaving spots on the smooth surface of the weapon. She was aware of the rebels, the smell of them. The desert filth, smoke, soot, sweat, semen, and blood. The odor of rapists and murderers. She was aware of the broken, half-human machine beside her, believing in its last moments that it had sacrificed itself so others might live. She was aware of her uncle's pleading eyes as he lay on the floor. She was aware of her own life draining away from her. And she was aware of Lindsay. Lindsay standing at the doorway, her trembling lips smiling. Most of all, she was aware of an empty sailboat on a choppy silver sea, its lone passenger finally free. I lied, Lindsay. I don't believe. I never will. 
I hope. I hope my story is the right one. She closed her eyes and dropped her hand. An electric buzzing, a circuit board shorting, a billion locusts humming, a live wire flailing in a storm, the noise increasing to such a pitch that it sounded like a hiss of breath through clenched teeth, a hiss that turned into a whirlwind. The rebels fell to the floor, clutching their ears. A window shattered, and a gust of heat caught Theopin, knocking him aside as if by an invisible fist and igniting his robes with wings of flame. He tumbled and collapsed, a silhouette in weeping fire. Thunder far below their feet shook the walls. The telescoping cover for the trigger swayed. The wreckage of the Elved rattled. Dag knelt, closed his eyes, and covered his face with his hands, his skin aglow from the growing inferno that was his son. The remaining windows exploded with a flash from outside. Heat poured down on all of them. Bars of light and shadow warred on the walls as the room dissolved in light. The brightest light Sabrina had ever seen. Light. Light. Light.